Well, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Willie Penn. Uh, he's the director of HI, uh, but I'm going to read a small, a short CV. Um, uh, Willie obtained his PhD in Princeton University in 1995. He was a Harvard Junior Fellow from 95 to 98 and then professor at the University of Toronto from 98 to 2001. At this time, he became director of the Academia and Sinica Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics, which is his now. His current research include the study of the cosmic neutrino background, pulsar VLDI scintillometry, hydrogen intensity mapping at high redshifts and fast radio burst studies with the Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment in China. In China. He has received several awards that include the Brockhouse Canada Prize for Interdisciplinary Research in Science and Engineering, the Governor General's Innovation Award, and the 2020 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for the collaboration with the Black Hole Shuttle. Today, he's going to present the holographic pulsar maps of the ISM in evidence of magnetic domain boundaries. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I, I hope you can have talked to people about possible collaborations. Hey, thank you. Yes. Uh, Pleasure to be here. My first time in Morelia. Uh, certainly, I hope it's not my last. I want to come back again. This is a very nice place to uh, visit. I was impressed, but very much deserves to be the UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, it's a very wonderful institute here. Uh, and I'm today hoping to tell you about something, like Susanna mentioned, um, both are. Synthonometry, VLBI is a very long and technical word that probably is not very helpful. So I'm going to try to explain something we've been doing for the last couple of years that was inspired by a visit by Peter Goldreich when he used to visit Toronto about something new that I learned. Originally, I was a cosmologist, um, but after a while, I guess it was unclear whether we're getting any closer to understanding dark matter, dark energy, or any of those things. So instead, um, Peter suggested to look at something that has a, a real chance of being understood, a problem that's both enigmatic and very data-rich. So let me try to explain what the problem even was and um, what we think this uh, may tell us about the, the nature of the interstellar medium. Just to start here, is for any of you have, who have been in and who have been in Toronto, I don't know, hope everybody else has a chance to be in there and visit. Uh, Toronto has an island um, just off the shore of downtown. If you stand on the island and look at the city, this is what it looks like. I used to be, Ram and Deep and I used to be at CETA. Our building, even though it is nice and high, is too low to be seen against the skyline. It's like behind the CN Tower somewhere. And um, the thing that whenever you are next time you're next to um, a lake, that I think is something everybody sees, and yet something worth just thinking through what's going on. So you see reflections of lights on the shore, on the water. Everybody has seen that. You also um, probably will have noticed that these things tend to be on a wiggly line. A line of images. These lines of images um, are extended, but they don't tend to go on all the way to the shore. So, for example, um, this red sign, it's an S for Scotia Bank. I don't know if any, is there Scotia Bank in there? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. So <laughs> you've, seen, you've seen this sign before, it's a red S. And in the water, you see it's stretched into a line that actually terminates on both sides. Okay, so any um, any feature on the skyline, this is a TD sign, um, terminates, uh, has some stretch, a, a wiggly line. And if you were to take a snapshot, so it's a bit dark, it's, I couldn't find anybody who, if you see an online snapshot, you let me know. Because instantaneously, these are actually a line of images. 
And these images move on a little bit as waves move over the lake. Okay, but instantaneous is actually a line of images. Um, perhaps this is not particularly profound, but just keep this in mind. Okay, why is it that these things tend to be on a roughly straight, not perfectly straight line of images? You know, the images don't tend to show up here. You know, we can see the, the, the correspondences. With all pieces. And this is a phenomenon of um, raising incidents reflection on the water surface waves. So even though this is a common phenomenon, it is something that um, we think actually is much more common than, well, it is already very common, but that is something which actually in our necessary medium is also observed, something to try to um, make this connection on um, what it is that uh, we observe. So first of all, my apologies that I am not an interstellar medium person. I have, I, whatever I learned was from a graduate course over 30 years ago. Um, that I, uh, as in those days, it probably has changed by now. I'm not even sure it was, uh, what I remember is even close up to date. And I'm sure the experts here who um, much, know much more about it than I do. But from my, from my stratospheric um, knowledge is that, roughly speaking, the ISM has three types of stable equilibria. You can have a hot, you can have a cold phase, a neutral gas. You can have a warm phase, of maybe around 10,000 uh, Kelvin, and that's a warm ionized medium. And then you can have a hot phase, probably millions of Kelvin. Uh, and these three phases, if they're roughly in pressure equilibrium, of course, means that the density differ by the ratio of temperatures. So the warm phase will be a hundred times more dense than the hot phase. So even though it only fills a small fraction of the volume, it actually contains much more of the um, mass, at least in the plane of the disk, um, than the hot phase would. Okay, so it's kind of the limit to what I, uh, what I, uh, what I know. But there's, I think, the details of that. Um, at least are uh, uh, fairly indirect and difficult to measure directly. So whenever, at least at the time, and again, I'd love to hear people here uh, have more detailed uh, information. I know 30 years later, maybe we know much more. But you know, how big are these regions of warm phase? Of these, of these, you know, we know that they don't, uh, that on average, the, uh, the average line of sight to a pulsar, so you can measure the amount of warm gas by dispersion measure, we can know distances, we know how much gas is, we know that they don't make up the majority, they may make up 10% of the volume. But how big, what's the structure of these clouds, of these lines, of these, you know, so the geometry, the size, the, what does the surface, be, what does the boundary between these look like? Um, I feel it's fairly hard because especially the, so here, in, in the cold phase, you can measure much more. You have, you have neutral atoms, you have lines, you can actually try to see what they look like. But the boundary between hot and warm, um, they're both basically invisible. I mean, you know, it's in H alpha, you say there are these H alpha maps, but it's really mostly two dimensional. Um, there is a surface brightness limit that is hard to see fine structure. So my, um, my distant understanding is that it's actually, um, uh, there's a lot, uh, there's, it's not entirely clear um, what the physical structure is between. Um, the hot and warm phases. Okay, now the warm phase, uh, even though it is, uh, it, you know, warm, this ionized warm hydrogen gas uh, is, is kind of invisible and doesn't, doesn't do much to light as it passes through. Uh, it does, however, um, lead to lensing, plasma lensing, when you do inhomogeneities, much like our atmosphere, even though it's transparent. Leads to scintillation, so stars twinkle, but even though it's not actually absorbing much starlight, and just the change of refractive index causes you to go in and out of focus and you get twinkling scintillation. Pulsars scintillate, and I'm going to explain a bit about um, what it is that you observe and what does that tell you about the interstellar medium. So that's what, I'm, what, what Peter Goldwash meant by it's a data rich field. All pulsars are known to scintillate all the time. And there are thousands of pulsars. So we have 
uh, and millions, billions of measurements of scintillation of this interstellar medium. So huge amount of data. And this data um, has been over time, or has been, has been known for over 50 years now. And um, it's the, I, the interpretation of what that is telling you about that medium has, in the last, I would like to think, in the last couple of years, undergone, the last 10 years maybe, undergone gone significant changes conceptually of what it is that is causing um, this lensing of pulsar radio waves. And then another, another phenomenon that Peter has pointed me to is a phenomenon called extreme scattering events. I'll explain that in more detail, but that basically um, extragalactic radio sources or pulsars that get lensed again by the interstellar medium um, by something in a relative group like in, in our galaxy, the plane of our, our disk mostly. And these have been enigmatic that, these, that there's not nearly, you know, if you look at these numbers, there's not nearly enough free electrons to cause this lensing. Just to go through. So in our um, Earth's atmosphere, uh, scintillation is of twinkling of stars is only modestly, uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's, it's almost inevitable because the size of these eddies due to turbulence of wind, uh, of laminar flow, gives you a small variation of copper the sound speed. So, so the number, let's say it's 10 to minus 6, I'm going to say, of the density variation, put that at 10 kilometers height, and that's actually enough to bend the light to actually focus on your eyes and, change, and give a measurable change. Now, with the interstellar medium, again, you know the electron density. And there is kind of a limit to how much you can um, put in the interstellar medium. So if you, since you need ionized gas, so neutral atoms do not cause plasma dispersion. So you need three electrons, which means they have a temperature of roughly 10,000 Kelvin or more. And yet you need a high density number of electrons. So the pressure is NKT. And if your pressure exceeds that of the interstellar medium, so the ambient pressure is maybe a bit uncertain, but let's say it's a few thousand NKT units, and that gives you a, a 10,000 Kelvin, gives you an upper bound of density of maybe 0.3 centimeter that you can confine in pressure equilibrium. And if you now look at what these, and again, I'll give you some examples of how it works. So this in 87 and almost 40 years ago, this was this led to a big um, mystery that you need um, free electron densities of 10,000 to cause these dancing events. It's a lack of a thousand, three thousand more than you could plausibly entertain existing in the interstellar media. So there are these um, un, 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 unallowed lenses in the interstellar media. Now, similarly, so um, the pulsar scintillation has been, um, if you look at the textbooks, the textbooks will say, well, the reason pulsar scintillate is due to diffractive lensing, diffractive deflection of light by structures that are maybe a, a few hundred kilometers in size. Okay, that, that's, that's the act, because you measure angles, um, you put in lambda over D, you know, if you, if you see the pulsar light, pulsar light being deflected by factor of an arc second, and then put in um, the, the, the wavelengths of, um, let's say, a meter, you get about uh, you know, an arc second is 100 kilometers over a meter of structure you need to bend light by that angle. And that has been taken as evidence that the ISM has substantial uh, modulation of, in, of, um, of density on 100 kilometer time, 100 kilometer length scales in the ISM, in the wall. Uh, ionized in down Kelvin, which also has been very mysterious because that is um, very small compared to any other scale diffusive wavy path. Now, any of these things, you would think, well, this is not reasonable. And uh, I mean, it, it's it's been it's actually you know um, physically, it's the last number you'd expect. So, but then since you say people say, oh, but you observe these poles after scintillate. Therefore, it must be true. And therefore, you adjust your plasma physics parameters until you make it work. In plasma physics, you can always invent a few more effects. <laughs> make whatever you want to make happen, happen. And whatever, people, people just you know, bend, bend the rules until, until you can make this happen. So 
here today I'm going to try to explain a um, a new picture. Hopefully, I will agree that's a data-driven picture that these two effects actually are related, and that um, they're both misinterpretations of uh, what they thought over the last 40, 50, 60 years um, is causing structures in the interstellar medium. Okay. I have all these words that I, I I'm, again, I'm the least expert on. <laughs> this is just things that we pick up from um, textbooks. Of course, we know that the ISM, um, you know, it gets driven by things, by supernovas, by galactic rotation, H2 region, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm the least expert in this room, I'm sure. Um, that the turbulent just looks, just looks turbulent, you know, you see, you see structures, there are clearly things happening on half second scales and above that will lead to. Uh, to convection and to turbulence. So that means that that's not uh, clearly, uh, that's clearly happening, which is why it, mot it motivated the picture of a turbulence driven on some scale comparable to the macroscopic size of the disk, let's say hundreds hundred of parsecs where, you, where things get driven, and um, that kind of cascades down by turbulence. Now, what's not entirely clear is what happens as you get to smaller scales. So as you go below a fraction of a parsec, um, then this question of well, the magnetic field start being important, and we see turbulence, and then you get into plasma physics again. And again, I think this one's the, the first of the topics get very, very technical, and um, it's also difficult to actually have a, a physical verification, so an experimental verification of these pictures as to how small a scale it actually cascade to, what the power law of the cascade should even be, how isotropic it should even be. So there are many leading order um, just uncertainties that you know say, okay, it's plasma physics, I have 23 parameters and I can go to fit whatever you measure. And that's a bit facetious, but at the end of the day, you know, okay, fine, you know, if you if you measure three things and you find you not more or less 10 three parameters, surely something it makes us go through those dots. Here, um, here's the classic um, paper, one of, one of the cases where the where a nature paper actually leads to a lot of debate for decades. This is called the extreme scattering Fiedler event. And what you observe is what they did is they monitored hundreds of extragalactic, very compact radio sources. I think for, I'm sorry, again, I'm not that good on radio sources either. Uh, for variability was the goal. And what they observed is, um, again, these words extreme. So it's ex extreme in the sense that the flux goes up and down by about a factor of two. Okay, that's, what, that's the extreme part. It's not, it's not a factor of 100. Extreme is a factor of two up and down. But a factor of two means that the lensing is not weak. Well, as you would expect these effects to be, say, a part in a thousand, given the expected. Um, so you measure, okay, so you measure these things to last for a few weeks. Okay, 81.1, whatever, tenth of a year. And you know that the, um, the extragalactic radio source is at rest in the universe, and the gas is moving at whatever, 300 kilometers per second, or maybe less in projection. We're also moving, but anyways, but whatever that geometry is, uh, whatever in that line of sight. The interpretation was that you, get, you have structures that may be a, a U in size, you get the transverse uh, scale from the time scale of, of just the, uh, the plasma and the sun and all that moving. And you know the magnification size, and from that, if the lens were bound, okay, you get a density. You, you know the size, you know the... So the lensing, of course, only depends on the projected column density. It doesn't tell you the density. But if you know, if you, since you know the transverse size, if you make it round, then you know the actual density. And that comes out with these uh, mm -hmm. conclusions that the ISM is filled with these lenses. And if they were around, they should be exploding at uh, high supersonic speeds uh, if they're really, they really a factor of a thousand overpressurized. These would be nuclear explosions that are super, that supernova, sure. Very briefly, <laughs> you can have very high pressure events that expand, but only in a human size. I think supernovas don't last to stay that pace for very long. And this would be very, very transient. That way, if that way is the interpretation, or if it's the shell of, this, of some shock front passing by you. Well, how do we know this is not intrinsic or close, something happening close to the source? It has to be a lensed effect. 
um, but, but uh, variation. So the, again, the, at the time, the argument was so this is at the upper part of the 2.7 gigahertz, and the lower part is at 8 gigahertz. So the interpretation has been that, uh, first of all, this, this time is not very short to be, because the radio emission is thought to occur. Again, first of all, I'm talking about way out of my uh, knowledge of ATS. I know nothing about, about radio ATS, but then apparently this, the radio emission is thought to occur uh, many parts of radio out there, somewhere out of the disk, where the, where the light crossing time is much longer than a, a few days that you observe. So it's thought to be not possible to be. Um, in the source itself. And then the fact that it's highly traumatic. Okay, again, it's taken as, you know, otherwise you would say, well, if it actually were an explosion, you know, you would think, why should the different frequency look so different if there had an actual explosion in there? So that, that was the arguments that were used at the time. Now, since then, of course, there have been many more uh, measurements, including VLBI, that all seem to indicate it actually is nearby. Okay, so the measurements, and I'll, I'll get to the, some of those later measurements in a bit. Um, but even at the time, this was taken very seriously. Nobody even then um, thought it's plausible to put it in the source or near the source. Everybody um, agreed that it has to be in local stellar medium, um, based on these time and uh, frequency scalings. And I think this has been, this, this part seems to have stood the test of time. Take this all with caution because a lot of things are stated that tend to not to be wrong. So it's important, very important to, point, to poke at all these little holes. Because there's something impossible is happening, we probably made one assumption to many somewhere. How frequent are these guys? I mean, for every pulsar, pulsar we have like so, one so this, every year. Or... So this is a quasar. Yeah. And quasar for compact radio sources, the duty cycle of these is about one percent. Yes, one percent of the time, any given radio source will undergo one of these. Of course, you can say it lasts a month. Then the other way of putting it, and for a given radio source, every 10 years, maybe one of these will happen. So it's not very frequent. We're going to look at many, at many sources, and then once in a while, six happen. So it's not very, very frequent, but also not extremely rare. Mm -hmm. So now let's go to pulsars. Okay. Pulsars exhibit lensing um, scintillation, and this up here is a um, is the well, this is this is a VLBI data for the top panel? It doesn't matter so much that it's VLBI, this is just the intensity of the pulsar as a function of frequency. And you can see this is only um, what half a megahertz, so it's only about a part in a thousand in delta lambda over lambda, okay, with a tiny fractional range of frequency. You can see that the intensity gets brighter and fainter, scintillation, highly chromatic scintillation. And it varies in frequency, very rapid, at very fine time scale, and in time in minutes. So this is our C, we can only observe this for 90 minutes. Um, and you can have these very fine, fine-grained um, scintillation of the pulsar intensity is up and down. And this is what people use to statistically. You say, oh, I measure the frequency range, the time range, and from that, you, from those two numbers, you extrapolate about the turbulence of the ISF. Normally done. Now, what's surprisingly relatively recent, so this is from the Buskin um, at all, the data is a Buskin at all. He sent me the data and I actually made this plot from his data. Um, is in VLBI, you get to measure the intensity at two different telescopes at the same time. And you get in addition to the total power, you also get, if you wish to call that, the difference. Of electric phase between the telescopes, in this case between Green Bank and our SIBO, separated by, again, yeah, should people know, know better than I do, I'm gonna say 2,000 kilometers, but I, I, I could be far off. I don't know how big our Western hemisphere is. But, anyways, it's some, some, separ some separation of the Earth's surface. And you can see that the um, intensity varies by um, a factor of a few, from zero to three. So, so the mean intensity is normalized to be one. So this is all, this is all the fractional variation of the pulsar flux. And the very peaks are a bit saturated. They can see not, not that many points are saturated. And at the bottom is the um, VLBI phase. Okay, so for a two point source that is unresolved, the phase is zero, both telescopes measure the same electric field. The fact that you're seeing phase changes 
means that they're kind of resolving it, not that strongly because the modulation is small compared to the modulation in intensity, but smallish. But already you can see some fairly um, striking features, which is, uh, I'm going to just make a statement that the red line, so the positive um, fluxes, always run in a downwards clip, in a downwards pattern, whereas the negative fluxes always run up. Always. <laughs> this is uh, just the old world. It's something odd. What's going on here? So, this people had puzzled over um, a little bit. I mean, it turns out that uh, yeah, this, is, this actually is the only, I mean, this is to my knowledge, the only published scintillation pattern of a pulsar in the last 55 years of VLBI pulsar history. So, these are great communities. Very, very technical. They both do their own thing. They use the same telescopes. They both use RCBO. They both use GBT. Or they both used to use RCBO. I guess sadly not anymore. Um, but they never use their, their instruments at the same time. So this has never been done before until 2010. It was the first time somebody decided to use a VLBI recorder to record a pulsar uh, and to actually look at the visibilities. Okay, so this is relatively recent. And that's just because these fields are very specialized. If you do a PhD in pulsar astronomy, yeah, you, you're unlikely to have enough time left in your life to do a VLBI and vice versa. <laughs> so um, there's, there's, there are probably like three people on the planet who have, who have been trained in both. And one of and these are, so this was um, J.P. McCart, Walter Briskin um, and company, uh, and sadly J.P. passed away as well recently. Um, who were actually able to control these two technical um, backends and make this happen. Now, the next step is to make an image on the sky. So, here's our attempt to image that, to make, you know, VLBI. Yeah, yeah, in fact, there are three telescopes that were involved. You can actually make an image. It's very, very technical, but uh, I'm just going to show you what the, what the pulsar light looks like. So what's going on here? The pulsar is intrinsically a point source that is micro arc seconds in size. So the, I mean, it's just, you know, the pulsar itself is open. even the radio reach, even the, you know, any size related to the pulsar, it's, it's, it's a one, one second period pulsar, surely it's no bigger than that. So even the light cylinder is only a light second in size and all that's you know, negligible um, compared to what you actually observe. So the fact that you can resolve it on, on an Earth-sized baseline of many milliard seconds um, already means you know in this case okay you know it's not a pulsar it's not thinking um, so this is clearly a propagation effect in fact if you measure since you can measure both the angular separation between images and the time delay field behind you have electric field everywhere you can actually find that the time delay is proportional to a sep angular separation squared and this is consistent with the screen at a single distance. So this pulsar happens to be at a distance of um, 620, 640 parsecs. And this screen is at 420. And that fractional distance is measured with better than a percent. It's probably the best measured distance in our universe. Um, that, but it's so what? Okay, so these are not useful measurements, but they're very precise because you can measure both the angle and the time delay to any position you want. Still, what's going on here? Why is a pulsar when when propagated through some something complicated on this guy look like a wiggly line? Why is that? And again, another thing that's bizarre is this is the first time anybody has ever tried doing this. And that VLBI both are never never mixed. I mean, socially in our community, it's big enough that this has never been attempted before. So now, when you do it, you find actually this is well, this is it, okay? A wiggly, a wiggly line is what um, what the le lensed images of the pulsar look like. This is measured. So this is one mystery as to what's going on. Why is the pulsar a wiggly line? And I think I will give you a hint from the first slide of all the wiggly lines. Just keep that in mind. There is, there is a generic way of making wiggly, yeah. but these are all optical illusions, if you wish. But you know, if you have a surface with waves. Okay. And then another um, funny thing is 
Yes, you have a set of lines, another set of points with, with VLBI alone, is they have a fairly large um, position, or well, large, they have some position uncertainty. I mean, this is, you know, milliarcsecond errors. By the way, these wiggles are um, microarcsecconds. So the measurement error is incredible in these measurements. This is EHT uh, resolution that one gets from this uh, pulsar imaging. And then the other question is, what is this? So it turns out that after an image, um, I talked to another former colleague, um, Dan Steinwing, who actually happened to have a monitoring campaign of the same photo on the same telescope at the same time, unbeknownst to the VLBI observer, observers, as so typical in these communities, you know, they, they, you know, you, one person with a VLBI proposal, the other person with a photo proposal, because of different tax, and they, 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 the tax didn't even know that the other guys had proposed the same object at the same day. They, these are just communities that would never talk to each other. I guess the schedule they never noticed that either. So it's just not scheduled. So he turns out had a series of observations um, for what, once per week for, uh, for six weeks or something. And then it turns out once you know the geometry of the screen from VLBI, and so we are that basically what it tells you is the orientation angle of the sky and the distance to the screen. It measures geometric quantities of your lens. But once you know them from the scintillation pattern, you can actually re-image the screen from the scintillation pattern alone. Okay, once you nail down geometric parameters. So what you see is that this pulsar is a line of these the wiggly line of images on one day. And then 48 days later, this wiggly line of images has moved. Well, of course, the what really happens, of course, is the pulsar has moved. And the images, well, move, well, with the pulsar. And again, I think with my, with my first slide, now you can, now you can see why, why this is not so shocking, except that, well, first of all, these are clearly quite elongated like, lines of images, not perfectly straight, they're, they're little wiggles. And they're clearly moving with a pulsar. Yeah, keep that in mind, this is what's measured. Now, this little island out here, and you can see with this uh, face, it's called face retrieval mapping, you can actually make, make, again, a highly precise map of these. These guys are not moving. So these guys move with the pulsar, and of course, they're just moving on both sides of the pulsar. And you know, I think this is, at some point, you know, there's a hint here already, but this is perhaps explainable. This thing to the offset that's not moving and not tight as a pulsar, not radially emitting out, but going at some odd angle to the pulsar. Okay. This makes you think. Um, is this, is these two phenomena may, may or may not be the same. Okay. Now, when you actually put numbers again to the amount of plasma you need to cause those images, especially because it, when you put numbers to this, it turns out this is, has it's the exact same numbers you get for the extreme scattering effects. Now, the reason why you can actually see it far away in the pulsar is this is at lower frequencies. This is 300 megahertz instead of 3 gigahertz. So the plasma in the factor index is 100 times higher. Then you can see it 10 times further away, lower frequencies. But uh, if you actually you can calculate this, if the pulsar would intersect this line, it would behave identically to that ending rate. It would last for two weeks, up and down, and look, we'll look at it identically because here we actually have measured the electron column density through this, through this lensing construction. And this is exactly an extreme scattering event lens. So what it tells you is here an image of what those lenses are, at least this has the exact same physical properties. Okay, so the pulsar, this pulsar is not, doesn't intersect it, but if it were to intersect it, it would look identical. And already you can see, well, this lens actually is not round, it's elongated. Highly elongated. And it stays put. So even though as a pulsar is moving, the location of the images is not moving, it's staying on the lens. Okay. So this lens is some object which is elongated in on the sky, it looks elongated. What it really is, of course, is you, you don't know the third dimension a priori. And um, you see this, this thing out there. Then again, there's no business being there, then this is not allowed, at least by the extreme lending argument. This is not possible in a, in a peaceful ISM. In addition, over 48 days, if you really thought it was exploding at that pressure, 
it shouldn't have stayed put. It should move faster than the pulsar. Okay, if it really was a shell of an explosion and uh, that kind of force, we keep that over density. I mean, that's a summer shock. You have an infinite over density if you wish. Um, but it's going to move fast. It's going to move at a, at, a, at, a, at a multiple of the sound speed proportional to the over density. A thousand times over density, you're moving at a thousand times the sound speed. This is going to be moving much faster than a pulsar. So the fact that it stays put means it's not an explosion. So this is uh, this just this got published last month. So what is the um, what is the linear scale? Let's see, milli seconds. So let's see. So okay. this thing is uh, it's about I think in AU this is at five hundred parsec, half a kiloparsec. So ten. So it's five milli seconds. Right? It's five milli seconds per AU. Yeah. So this is uh, two AU. This way, yeah. okay. this is maybe a, no, no more than tenth of an AU. Um, transfers. So I don't know, isn't that why do people think it's going to it should explode? Because why can't it be confined by supersonic collision of streams? Well, if it's supersonic, um, I mean, you have to say if, if it's perfectly balanced, fine, right? But if it's a thousand times, you know, if the relative speed relative to the to the um, quiescent ISM is a factor of a thousand, to have the residual velocity be only one part in a thousand seems very, very, you know, fine tuned. Yeah, these two shocks would have to collide in the center. Of the, the, the pulsar proper motion is, is how big? I think this is, I, I, I think it's a water um, 200, of order 200, 200 per second. Okay. Yeah. So this is not moving at all, but it's a pulsar's proper motion. Yeah. yeah. And so I think the, yeah, so the, the, the thing is that you need like 300 kilometers per second. Um, Intrinsic speeds, speeds but rejection there at best. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is why this uh, unconfined seems just a big coincidence. And is it related to course? Or am I, is that ah, the thing again? Okay. You, 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 <laughs> you should have been entering this game earlier. So this is clearly what we need here. Plastics. <laughs> so there is a, I don't know why, mathematicians managed to sell this word caustic, they call them catastrophes. It's a very catchy name. Um, and they come in, um, it, it's, it, it's a property of, of algebraic geometry. Okay, you take some polynomial that defines a, a surface, a polynomial um, in three dimensions confined, it describes the points along some surface. And when you project it down uh, onto, some onto some plane, the projected density of a sheet. Um, there are different things that can happen if you have a fold. This is called a fold when a sheet folds over itself. Then the density, of course, um, is high at the fold. In fact, it's, it's for an infinitely thin sheet. The density is technically infinite at the uh, fold caustic, of course, of called fold catastrophe. And um, so it, on, on this side, the den projected density in principle is infinite. Of course, for, for a finite thickness sheet, this um, will not actually be infinite. And you can see that whenever you, if you have a region which has no fold and a region which has a fold, then by continuity, then somewhere in between, there must be an unfolding point, and that's called a cusp caustic, a cusp catastrophe, where you have basically in projection, what happens is that these two caustics will appear to merge, and you get an even stronger enhancement in the projected density. Because, uh, and not the fact of two, okay, so it's, it can be large large enhancements as these two um, caustics combine. So if, if it just has two caustics in projection that, combine, that just cross over each other, that's back of two, and then they keep going on the other side. But in this case, it's actually unwinding, and these caustics merge and, and disappear on the other side, and in between you, get, you can get a very large enhancement in the projected density. And of course, well, uh, shockingly enough, this gives you a highly elongated apparently very high density projection without anything interesting happening, without anything catastrophic happening, despite the name that it's a catastrophe. Um, this is an apparent catastrophe. There's nothing catastrophic physically happening um, in, your, um, in, your, in your structure. Okay, you can see where I'm getting to, that um, sheets um, intrinsically have these, um, can, can lead to these enhancements. And of course, the misinterpretation has been that these objects are round. Okay, these caustics is, is anything but round. So the thickness this way and the length this way, they can be off by orders of magnitude. 
It's related to the thickness, the ratio of the sheet thickness to the sheet's size. The same sheet that's large, there's no, there's no limit to how much this can be enhanced in projection. And therefore, you may not need extreme conditions with the ISF. If this is getting maybe too technical, I'm going to jump over this and I may come back if, if, it needs to, if it needs to put some technicalities of how it actually works. Again, back to this picture. Um, and then now, so, so, so far it's, it's just data, okay? So far, but this, this sheet was just the analogy. The first thing to show people is data. I'm going to go to now from physical speculation. And th at this stage, is probably, um, again, also only speculation. But you ask, well, what, what can you do to make surfaces in the interstellar medium? Is there any me known mechanism at least? And I think there is a, a word we often hear, which is called a reconnection current sheet. Okay, that's at least a word that, that I think has popped around enough. Again, I'm not an expert on these, uh, on these plasma effects at all, but I do know that depending on who I talk to, my, like my plasma colleagues, and you ask them, well, you know, how thick should it be? How long should it live? How long should it last? Um, you know, two people in the same hallway will differ by 10 orders of magnitude. In, in, the, in you know how long how long the reconnection event should take, um, and therefore this is a, a good way to get a, 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 a lively debate going. But it also means that you know I think the details may not be that important. That basically anything goes as far as I can tell in terms of how long lived you think a, a domain should be and how thin it should be. Okay, to be ethically watched. Oh, I think I see what you mean. Sorry, but I'm going to be facetious here. But I think you know just talking to my respected colleagues. They, they, they clearly have very different um, including our, uh, our, our editor of the app, Jay uh, Vishniak, used to live um, used to, uh, used to live at the master, but spent, spent his scientific time at CETA. She also, uh, well, it's just one of the experts who has, anyway, a broad overview of people's opinion that he assures me that uh, this is a, a problem with, uh, with a broad range of possible outcomes. So um, then I'm just gonna, going to um, therefore uh, start with just the basics that I think are, of, are agreed upon and are not um, contested, which is that a magnetic fluid in, so what if you take the I, if you take a the ISM, which is a plasma and it's known to have a magnetic field for, for a different topic as to why it does, but it has a magnetic field that's not controversial, again, measured by polar rotation measures and polarization, other things. It's known that magnetic field, which is not tiny, okay? Magnetic field makes up a, a, some fraction of its total pressure, and certainly a large fraction of the variation of the total pressure. So the alphanic, the four waves, these, um, these things are not, are not tiny for, for the perturbations. Um, the question of that is the size of perturbations in the ISF. Now, what that means is, um, if I just, you know, if I stir up, stir up the medium and then the field gets tangled, the field wants to straighten itself out. Field says, you know, the, the MHD equation strives for you to become a straight field. Um, but of course, you know that, that, like in any magnetic system, different regions may not agree on which direction they should align themselves to. And in physics, we often call that spontaneous symmetry breaking. Bell magnetism is taken as the picture book example as, um, as to how that works. And then um, when regions disagree of which way they should have settled down on, then at the interfaces of these regions, you get what's technically called um, magnetic domain boundaries. Okay, so our hard disks work on that principle that you have magnetic domains that you can rotate around. This is not this is a, a, a well studied problem in certainly lens matter physics that, um, that these things form thin boundaries for the magnetic field changes discontinu well, discontinuously, but on a, very, on a very short time scale with a huge ratio of thickness to length. These magnetic boundaries have such generic properties that magnetic fields like to like creating static. In fact, you can, you can calculate it, but just take magnetic field that's constant, that's certainly a static solution. If I rotate the magnetic field by 90 degrees, uh, there's no, uh, that, that can continue on, and of course the whole thing is static, a static, formally static solution, except that the very discontinuity is a bit less clear what's gonna happen, but everywhere except for this tiny collision region, this is a static solution, and just rotate the field by any angle I want. 
Um, this is this gives 180 degrees if you wish, then it's explicitly the same because pressure only depend on D square. And um, even by any other angle, this is allowed. Here is just again a picture of the uh, donors from Wikipedia. This is what magnetic domains apparently you can take pictures of it. And this is, I think, just to the obvious that magnetic domains like settling down with very um, thin. Uh, boundaries. So, but the next ingredient, you have boundaries and you need waves. And remember, this lake has small waves, but there are waves that we need to get this line of images. So, when you have a misalignment of a magnetic field, what it means is that the sound dispersion relation differs on both sides of this discontinuity. And then if you just solve the wave equation, this is just like the, um, the air and water boundary that you just have different dispersion relations above and below. And you get what we call surface waves in MHD when you have, when all, if all you do is you change magnetic field discontinuously by any angle except for 180 degrees, 180 degrees of plane waves don't know about it, but you get any other angle. Then of course, because alphane waves are anisotropic, um, the, for most k vectors, they will travel at different speeds on both sides. And if the sound speed on two sides of any medium um, differs, then you get um, surface waves. So these are waves that decay exponentially into the medium and just propagate along the surface. And um, these things are called, they're technically called ducted alphane surface waves in ideal MHD. And apparently they observed in solar flares to, to occur. I mean, it's not shocking, they kind of don't have a choice. And based on that, um, U11 and I built this picture that you have these inclined boundaries. So again, there is a magic angle. Um, if your inclination angle is more shallow than the bending angle of the wave, then the surface will appear folding back on itself in projection. Okay, so if you have many, many such boundaries, so the ISM is filled with these boundaries, with these surfaces, most of them you see at a straight short angle, and there's not enough um, electron density to do anything interesting or to lens. But once in a while, they are aligned to your line of sight, and that's when you see the extreme scattering events. Okay, so this is now the, um, the interpretation that you don't need exotic. In fact, in fact you know, when Peter Goldreich um, told me this, I asked our local resident experts on, on these topics, and in fact, Chris Thompson was in the room with me, and Chris Thompson told me, I don't know if he told me that, that, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, I've been thinking about these, and it's, these must be superconducting cosmic strings, so again, you know, how do you confine these plasmas, you put, apparently, it tells me that with cosmic strings, yeah, there's no problem at all confining plasma identity that would be just that, it's clear observation of evidence. That uh, there's no other explanation because that's possibly very everything else is crazy. And there's another fellow who came at me at that time, which is Brian Gensler. He's moved to Toronto, so he works on ISM. And I asked him, Oh, Brian, what do you think is going on? You know, he says, Oh, my colleague um, tells me that the that still is the best explanation of it is exploding dark matter. <laughs> so, okay, so this is this is. Pretty extreme. <laughs> um, but you know, this is just, you know, you push to a corner that there's not, not no, there, at that time at least, there was no other plausible explanation. There was no reason for explanation that why Peter came to me and says, look, you know, look at this problem. There is data, there's a huge amount of data. That, you know, look at the data and try to see if it makes sense. Um, you know, you, can, you see, you can actually measure these. It's, it's not, um, this is, that doesn't have to be left to speculation. Okay, so I think this is basically the story that, uh, that's, uh, that the way that at least I've seen it evolve over the last couple of years. And I thought, oh, this has been a very, very interesting um, journey, at least for, for us, is that so there's this new tool. So POSAR real VI. Okay, so to apply um, two old tools to an old problem. <laughs> Um, no, that's fun, right? It's, it's sometimes you look around and say, oh, you know, what is there? My students often ask me, what is it to do? How am I going to solve the dark energy problem? And again, you know, I, I don't know. There are some problems that actually can, um, for, which, for which you are actually looking at something nobody else has ever tried before. 
and you have a completely new map on um, on things that you know they can be done. There's lots of lots of telescopes, lots of objects you can look at. There's no shortage. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to build the next dark energy telescope, which which costs billions of dollars. Um, you can just use existing archival data. This is all archival data taken 10 years ago. Okay, so all we did is we asked them who has data. And we, this is, so far has been based on no new data. And nobody had looked at the data in this way. And we say, lo and behold, now everything falls together. Yeah, all well, these data suddenly. Um, the, uh, our interpretation is that there is no defective turbulence. Because it's hard to explain why defective turbulence leads to a line of a good line of images, okay, discrete images. I mean, it's hard to see on that plot, but the images actually are separated from each other. I mean, it's not, that's not possible with diffraction. Diffraction, everything is blurred. If you really have a volume filling line of turbulence, you get a very, very blurry image. You never get a straight line of plots. And um, that, of course, this magnetic domain thing, that's, that's, that's interpretation. It's not, the data doesn't tell you that there is magnetic domain boundary. Um, but I think we are hopeful that this can also be measured because at a, domain, a magnetic domain discontinuity, your fairly rotation should change discontinuously. And since you have images on both sides of this discontinuity, and according to our estimates, it probably is possible to extract that. Now again, for technical reasons, pulsar data is never recorded with polarization to, to save disk space. Because the state, you know, it takes four times more disk space to save four Stokes parameters than it does just to save Stokes I. And since, since it's already big enough pain to analyze Stokes I, and people think, oh, I'm not going to save four times more data just, just in case, there's very little polarized pulsar data in the literature. So um, we're still looking around, but again, you can take what there's nothing, you know, these receivers don't have a problem. The radio telescopes intrinsically detect polarized radiation, and you can always turn on, you know, even for pulsar recorders, um, there is always the option of storing full, full Stokes parameters, even if it's not normally done. So these are all, you know, things that can actually still be, um, be done without, again, building any new telescopes. It is just this, uh, with just thinking of new ways of um, evolving. And of, of course, what I'm also hopeful is that not just in our Milky Way, but across the whole universe with FRBs. FRBs also scintillate. They have been observed to scintillate. I've been pushing to observe um, FRBs in polarization with VLBI. And um, so I hope that we can use this to probe not just our local neighborhood, but um, the whole universe. Thank you. So much for the very interesting talk. We're going to go for more questions. This is, is it a way to actually measure the curvature, or is it uh, like possible with the current conditions? Again, these are all good questions. I, I suspect it may, I think this is so new that all these, pop, all these questions, you know, we need to try out just to go through. Can you actually measure you know, the physical you want to ask? Now, how thin is this actually? How long is it actually? How curved is it actually? Exactly. It may well be observable. It's just so new. This is just the very first steps. You know, this is like discovering the new world. This is really interesting, actually. Um, I have so many questions. But one of the things I was wondering is so we have these magnetic like, dynamic simulations. right? And, and recently, we're seeing all these sheet, like very thin sheet like structures very elongated, but sort of the width is very thin. Yes. Have you tried sort of putting a pulsar source and seeing what the magnetic variations will give you out? So just, just to say when you say very thin, so when simulators say very thin, they mean, they mean yeah, mean subparsex. we need 0.1 AU, right? so still find all of the magnitude away from from actually interpreting data. So when you extrapolate and say, oh, if I just say it keeps yeah. going down by a factor of, uh, of 100,000, um, probably, but I think that's a big extrapolation. So I think right. it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit early to directly. Okay. So you get your kind of resolutions. Much, much better. <laughs> okay. 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 I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Uh, in thermal instability can also form uh, thin sheets in the ISM, those Cardinal 7H1. Uh, you think it 
could be also a, another possible source for this? Or I'm talking nonsense? No, I, know I, I'm talking think, nonsense. I think this, this is a fascinating question. In fact, um, if, if the people here who have thought about this problem, there was a paper by McCord and Company in 2018 uh, called a shadowing problem. And if, and if you follow that business, that the cooling instability um, leads to what they call um, a runaway. So, so the problem is that if originally you were in pressure equilibrium um, at let's say a million degrees, as you cool down the cooling instability, your sound speed drops, your temperature keeps dropping faster and faster, such that the region that you stay causally connected shrinks very quickly. So even though you may initially have had a pressure confined cloud, of course, you know, as you cool, you would think, oh, maybe the cloud will, will shrink, but it, can, it cannot do that because the different pieces of the cloud don't know how to collapse together. So what happened, what they, the picture they call it is called shadowing. That's the whole thing. Fragment goes into a fractal structure. That um, indeed, so in, indeed, this is one of the things that uh, has been proposed for, uh, again, extragalactic, what's called the magnesium absorber problem, another problem that may be related to this. And I think it's still in the very early days. It was only 2018. Again, I would have thought, you know, I would have thought that Martin Luis or somebody would have discussed this 50 years ago, but they didn't. And it's only been very recent that this, again, is another interesting line of physical mechanisms to generate that. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk about something I had never heard about before. Um, so, Maybe I'm interpreting the main interpretation wrong, but the pulsar moved and the sheet didn't. That's right. Did you expect the sheets not to move? And that's one, that was one question. And the other question I probably missed, what were the things that didn't move like the place? So what were the things that did not move? You had this picture, so, so it's the one where the pulsar moves. Yes. So there. So apparently the, the pulsar moves and the sheet does. This does not move. And those and these points what, do move, right? Yes. And what are those things? You mean, what are these things? No, the ones the top, on top, the, the top, ones the that top. never moved. Well, our interpretation is that it is that it is a, a, a full cusp. Oh, okay. That's like what this. it is. Okay. But well, what's the source? The, the source is. No, the pulsar, so the pulsar light, it's still the pulsar. The pulsar light gets bent to here and back to the line of sight. So it's, it's, just, it's the same light that's bent. In fact, it's, this is pulsar, this is a pulsar. So you actually, it's going on and off. So you, you know this is pulsar. There's not, there's not a line of source. It's not, there's no other source in this, in this field. Okay. Okay, so this is the fold. This is the fold or whatever it is. Exactly, there's a fold. It's the here. fold. Yes. And it, the sheet didn't move. So. And this, this fold did not move, that's right. This fold, in fact, this fold in this picture terminates at this point because the line of images stops. Mm -hmm. okay. that's so the my question was, do you expect the sheet not to do anything in the time scale that the pulsar did move? So again, a few just numbers, which is that if you take a, a, a one of these surface words, so if, these, if the whole thing, um, if you say, well, what's causing to these things in the first place, you say, okay, alphanic, alphanic surface waves, they should move at alphanic speed, so kilometers per second is what they, or maybe a few kilometers depending on the field strength. You might expect these to move in three dimensions at a few kilometers per second. However, because you're looking at it in projection, all that velocity is along your line of sight, and in projection, it will be a hundred times slower, so it's moving at only meters per second in projection. So this fold will appear almost not not a hundred percent static, but almost static. There was a question in the back. Sorry, um, you look in your last slide, please. Which slide? Your last slide. It's a summary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, can you pick up a little bit more of this paper for the session, please? Or what do you mean with that? Okay. So. Um, So in, in this surface, if you interpret the surface as being the interface of two magnetic domains, but the field is pointing in this extreme case, on the left side is pointing up, on the right side is pointing down. Okay, let's say that's why they're in the sheet. Well, that means that in a, um, since, since we are interpreting that some of the images passing through this side of the, of the, the back of the sheet, other images are staying on the front of the sheet, 
that they are passing through different magnetic field directions. Therefore, this image uh, on one, so this delayed image should have a slightly different Faraday rotation from the image on the other side. And that's in principle observable. It turns out it's a small angle, but on the other hand, because it's a differential measurement, okay, it's the same, it's, it's the same, the same, you know, there's, there's no intrinsic change of the, the pulsar intrinsically has the exact same angle um, on both images. You again, you should, we may be able to detect, we're talking about maybe a 1% um, rotation angle change, but that may well be measurable. But you can also measure the rotation nature uh, or the, the polarization. Yeah. In, yes, again, the telescope can measure it. But in with your um, observations, you can. Well, in the, in the past, pulsar observers um, tend to only take home the Stokes eye and they tend to delete the other Stokes <laughs> when, when they go home. I mean, they, the telescope usually records them and when they go home, they only take, in, in those days, they had, you know, what, what the hard disk or the tapes and they didn't want to bother copying the other ones. So archivally, they're hard to find. It's difficult to find polarized data on pulsars archivally. But from the FRB, as you mentioned earlier, people are recording polarized data. Well, you'd be surprised. So amongst the published FRBs, um, maybe a few percent of them have published polarization data, again, for the same reason. They, the people who record them never don't record them, but more data. Typically, no, but it can be done. So, uh, this is beautiful work. Really. Uh, I understand your point about the projection uh, angle and that the outplane waves will not be moving uh, in the plane of the sky, but surely the, the main walls will be moving with the general ISM turbulence, which again is the world of the outplane speed. Well, um, unless you're saying it's the, there is no turbulence. <laughs> at least on the smallish scales, we think the, the turbulence doesn't go down to very small scales in this picture. In fact, it cannot because um, these things are fit, seem fairly, fairly rigid, fairly stable. Now, there is, of course, the net um, rotation um, that the gas, so again, what I, I remember from the um, of course that was. So our sun um, moves not exactly in a circle, but in a in a epicyclic motion around the local standard of west. So so even if something was truly addressed in the interstellar medium, but truly it wasn't the LSR, it will appear to be moving towards the sun's reflex motion. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. The sun is moving, and the, earth, and the other things are moving, and of course, course everything else is moving in time. Now. The interstellar medium, of course, we know has to all the move retrograde but into LSR because it's got a finite pressure, it's got a finite height. So LSR is only for a zero temperature medium. And in fact, even at, at even at 10,000, you're going to be moving um, a few percent slower than LSR. I mean, LSR is 200 from per second, and it's, it's, 10, it's, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a measurable, um, a measurable relative motion. So all these things, indeed, in fact, should not be truly addressed. And um, in fact, those, 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 my guess, are the leading, will be the leading motions. So when, when we say it's roughly, if this is compared to the pulse on the background moving at, let's say, 200 kilometers per second, the typical pulsars have a high proper motion. And to see, you know, what, what's our LSR motion? A few, a few, yeah, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 kilometers per second is our LSR kind of velocity. And again, you, you expect the other things to be of order of that. So at a few kilometers per second, I think things should move in the, indeed. And whether turbulence is large or small compared to the systematic ones, you know, the turbulence is likely less. Than, again, I, I think there are people who use other terms, supersonic turbulence, but on the whole, turbulence is subsonic, whereas the other things are roughly coupled to sound speeds. Yeah. So I expect, yes, since the leading effects will be the bulk structures, and these are opportunities to directly measure how fast these things actually are moving. Again, it's, it's very rare to get them. I guess you see lines, but with lines, you never quite know where they are. So you usually use the other way around. You measure a line, and then you say it's at rest, and then you get a distance that way. But here, you get a distance and a line and a motion. Okay, so here's a, a rare case where you get to measure a velocity in 3D with, with zero error, with zero uncertainty in the radio distance. So you know the position of this 
could see you know, you know the exactly distance of the lens to perfectly yes you need so to, you what need, is yeah. the distance to, to, the, to the lens explain yeah 420 puzzles in which direction and this one is it's is at a b of i think 20 or 30 meaning it, this, is, this is maybe mm -hmm. 200 parsecs mm -hmm. above the plane. Yeah, but um, the plane. The galactic painting, you expect this to be very um, mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. region, very mm -hmm. manipulative. Okay, so I don't think anybody has seen a star formation. So if you look at that line of sight and ask, you know, uh, is, does, does that place happen? There's no obvious star formation. There's nothing there. There's no obvious. There's, there's nothing there. obvious happening there. I think I'm a little confused. I mean, okay, these things are now more less rigid and they last, but then what is the connection of these things with one of the first slides where you have a D? The last thing, the thing where you have a D, uh, a trouble. Yes, so, exactly. So, the because here we measure all these angles and densities, so we actually, we actually know how much projected call density there is. We can now predict what a pulsar would look like if you were to move across that sheet, and it looks just like that observed. Uh, like the yeah, it, it looks very much. It looks very much like the very observed, first observed feed like it. So it looks a lot like the upper one. Okay. The lower one, I think, most interpretation is that at higher frequencies you get you get what's called lensing caustics. So that's just the opt optical interference between images. And that this is probably related to internal structure of the quasar itself. So if you really, you know, have a high resolution scan over the over the um, over the quasar, uh, in fact, this has also been proposed for microlensing of the quasars that you're probably seeing structures in the accretion disk of the of the quasars through the lensing plus lensing process. What is your proposed explanation then for the for the images that do move with the pulsar in the previous slide? Ah, so, oh, so th these images yeah. we interpret as being a different sheet at a different distance. In fact, the measure the distance is a measure to be different. You actually know the distances to both. So these are at a different distance, and that is the line of images, um, just associated with um with some other random sheet that is not at a cusp. But just at a regular fold. So for every fold, you get an image. Okay. And it's on a line. And it's just like the waves on a lake. For every fold on the wave, you see an image on of the background building. And as the building moves, those things stick to the building. Whereas the, the cast does not stick to the building. Okay, one last question. Okay, Sorry, can I ask one quick question? This is really interesting. Um, and you, you, so I probably missed this, but you can rule out that it's a, not a line of sight effect, that, that it's like smaller combination of some sort of structures that basically project into this shape. Well, well first of all, we can measure the distance to every single image individually to better than the percent. Okay, so we do know that they're all at the exact same distance. That's, that's directly measured. And, um, well, I mean, that's okay. So you measure an angle and a time delay. And obviously, if you have two lenses, you, you can, then you're misinterpreting it. So it could be then the lenses doesn't have to be a distance. But if they are far away from each other, because it's such a straight line, you know, you'd have to explain why these two things that are physically separated know to image in the exact same direction. And that's a challenge in having two sheets. But on the other hand, two sheets, it is, of course, you know, we're trying to have it both ways because we are interpreting this other cusp to be a cast minute in a sheet, in a different sheet. So we are, we do want to have both, both of these interpretations. But um, these cusps are, uh, because they have, they have a higher projected density, are visibly much further away from the line of sight. And that's why we observe these occasional cusps and extreme scattering events, whereas on a, otherwise typically you only observe the one inclined sheet. Okay, I don't see any hand raised on Zoom, so let's look in here and thank you when you can provide.